So welcome to the uh, Soaring Society of Boulder's Ground School Series. Uh, we've uh, Tonight, we've got a couple things going on. Uh, first of all, uh, Clemens is going to give us a uh, little preview of next week's uh, land out database. And we really are looking forward to uh, all the pilots who are at uh, Colorado Soaring and at Black Forest uh, Soaring and uh, the guys who kind of unaffiliated with clubs but are scattered about on the on the west western slope. Uh, we're looking forward to getting input from as many pilots as possible on that. Uh, so we'll hear from Clemens first, and then we're going to hear from uh, uh, Gary Stuby, who's going to talk about towing and tow planes and gliders and things like that. So first of all, I'd like to turn it over to our uh, SSB president, Clemens Sipic, who will uh, talk a little bit about uh, the land out database that's coming up. Clemens, uh, please proceed. All right, thank you, Armand. I'm not going to take a lot of time here, so it's just two or three minutes. Uh, just a preview. So this is more to ask people to please participate next week in, in a discussion. Uh, so this is not a presentation that we're going to do. We're going to do a discussion about land out fields. Uh, I will share one. So this, by the way, is a <clears throat> nice view of South Park. Uh, 285 is on the, on the left. Um, but the uh, <clears throat> basically what I'm going to share next week is a demo of a crowdsourced land out database that has been that I found that actually is being used in Europe. It covers all the Alps and it covers Spain and it covers Namibia and it covers uh, uh, parts of Germany where you need land out fields. And uh, so I talked to the folks uh, that manage that uh, and put that database up. It's a crowdsourced database. And basically, everyone can upload database fields um, to the site. And then uh, users, that if you register as a user, you can also download a waypoint file that gives you all those, all those fields. And when I say they give you the fields, it's, it's really nice because you can upload information about the field, but you can also upload photos that you took. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, you, the, the more we can share, it's really a crowdsourced effort. So uh, the idea is to, to gather as much information as, as we can about specific fields. And so I've worked with them and uh, translated, helped them translate this thing into English. And uh, so I'm going to demo this next week, see how it works and what do you think. And uh, if, if that's a, a way we want to share information about land out fields, I think this would be a, a pretty useful way of doing it. So we'll, we'll get into this next week. Uh, just be, please be there uh, for the discussion. Uh, and then also please be prepared to share. Uh, so this is kind of a one week notice to uh, think about what you have available. So, you know, maybe your cup file of, of land out fields or um, information that you've gathered over the years uh, about specific fields as you drive around. Uh, what is it that you actually have? I mean, and, and I'm, I'm willing to, uh, I will send this out after, after today's meeting, I'm going to send out my cup file to everybody with my land out fields. And um, I will also send you a link to that, to that uh, crowdsource database. So you can take a look at it yourself and uh, we'll take less time doing the demo. But basically the way we want to do it next week is, is just a discussion where we go through, you know, the demo and then, um, People who are interested, uh, please share what you have available. And if you're interested in contributing to a kind of a communal effort of creating a Colorado uh, land out database um, that we that we try and keep current, I think that would be would be super useful. Um, so watch out for an email uh, after this discussion. I will send you this link to this um, uh, database, and I will send you my cup file and some other information that uh, you might find helpful. So that's it. That's all I wanted to to share. Okay, thank you, Clemens. Uh, there's one other thing I want to go over on future uh, uh, future sessions, and that is uh, wanted to have a capstone session that was really focused on the uh, new pilots and, and new and and pilots who haven't really started flying cross country yet. And I planned a a, a, a kind of a forum. Uh, with a panel and then a bunch of a what I call a gaggle of, of uh, newer pilots. And 
just got no response from the newer pilot, uh, almost no response from the newer pilots. So uh, if that May 11th uh, doesn't materialize, if we don't get some people who, who are interested, uh, we'll, we'll just cancel that one because it just doesn't seem to be, uh, I was kind of excited about it, but uh, evidently there's, there's no interest from, uh, or very little interest from our aspiring pilots to do that. So anyway, with that, um, uh, so talk to the aspiring pilots and see if you can motivate them. If not, um, we'll, we'll just uh, conclude the session one week earlier. Uh, so anyway, right now let me introduce Gary Stubbe. Uh, Gary is a 4,000 hour uh, instrument rated uh, pilot who uh, worked up a lot of hours in Southern California commuting to work uh, uh, near uh, near the ocean, but he lived up in the mountains and he flew in every day and that's pretty busy airspace. So I'm, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of experience and a lot of stories there that go with that. Um, he also is, rel he's relatively new to, to gliders, uh, but he's also, but he's a past Soaring Society of Boulder president and currently uh, SSB's vice president. Uh, he's been tow pilot of the year, I think it was in 2018. Um, and he steps up to tow uh, uh, really regularly and, and also uh, will come in if we need him. Uh, he, he's been just super on, uh, on helping out with towing. Uh, and he likes to go on retrieves and he likes to like shut down the airport so that he can do the retrieve. It's uh, uh, maybe he'll talk about that, I don't know. Uh, even more so, uh, Gary rebuilt and I mean totally rebuilt, like right down to the frame. It took a, even got a brand, it got a new frame uh, for our Super Cup, completely rebuilt that. And as a result, the members just unanimously voted them uh, in as a life member. So uh, Gary doesn't have to pay any dues <laughs> for, for the rest of his life. Um, He's also a horseman and uh, likes horses and, and he's a hunter and a fisherman and he also rides his BMW uh, dual sport motorcycle. Uh, so uh, he's a full faceted guy. And with that, uh, I wanna turn it over to Gary. Gary, please take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Armin. Very kind and I uh, appreciate it. I, uh, I think uh, I'm a jack of all trades, a master of none and uh, uh, this has been a fantastic program. All the all the guys that have been talking, really impressed by it. a lot of them are just guys I knew from the airport, and I had no idea the depth of their knowledge. You know, like uh, Bob Ferris is just an encyclopedia of weather information, and uh, you know Bob Caldwell and his experiences, and uh, uh, to hear Tom Zollner's adventures and all, and uh, you know they've all been fantastic. My only complaint is it's a really hard act to follow. I mean, I, my presentation is pretty simple, but uh, you know, here I am following some of the best soaring pilots in the country. And uh, it's, it's really a, a fun group to belong to. So uh, any of you guys from, that are, aren't part of the SSB, if you ever get a chance, come out and, and see us here in Boulder on a, on a summer weekend is the best time to come out and meet a bunch of the guys and everything. We, we have a lot of fun. Uh, so that said, let me get started here and uh, hopefully this will all work well. Um, this one. And stand by, I'm getting this. Enter full screen. Can everybody see this okay? Yes. Yeah, it's the, the, the play button, Gary, at the top. That's what he wanted. Oh, yeah. There we go. So today, uh, today's event is, it's a brief seminar for SSB towing topics. And it includes uh, information for uh, wing runners, for tow pilots and for the glider pilots. And I'll touch a little bit on maintenance, some of the maintenance things that, that come up. It would be a fairly short presentation. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really trying to cover some of the uh, uh, lesser known, or some of the 
some of the information that you may not know as a glider pilot of what it's like to be a tow pilot and for what it's and vice versa for the tow pilots what it's like to be a uh, fly for the gliders and uh, as I was putting this together I actually came up with a lot of items for the wing runners so I'll spend a fair amount of time on that as well uh, first thing is uh, maintenance uh, I'm now the ship manager for both of the tow planes and I do all of the, uh, we, we just finished the annuals on both of them. We re-clocked re the, the annuals to February. So they were both finished. And uh, I do all the work. I'm in training to get my a and I need the experience, uh, to meet the experience requirement. So the hours I spend on the tow planes are, are uh, hours that I'll use to uh, apply to my a &P application. And I'm working under direct supervision of an IA uh, John Pafford, he's a semi-retired IA, and he spent 30 years working on Pawnees and Super Cubs as tow planes. So anything I do uh, goes through John, and I talk to him regularly, and I'm, I'm regularly sending uh, uh, emails to him and asking him about things, and uh, it's it's good relationship. We have a lot of fun working together, and he's he's over at the airport regularly, too. Uh, and one thing that uh, I ask for the tow planes for you tow pilots is please report the squawks directly to me on the tow pilots. Uh, I mean, on the tow planes, but as well as on the gliders, you guys fly on the gliders. If there's a squawk, make sure you report it to the ship manager. You can, uh, you know, there, in, in my view for the tow planes, I do not want anybody to try to fix anything. You know, do standard add it, add air to the tires, uh, maybe add some fluid to the brakes and the super cub occasionally. Uh, but I want to be the person that fixes anything on it. And the reason is that that way I can go through the IA. I have all the right tools. I've got calibrated torque wrenches. Uh, I've, I've now, after doing the super cub, I've put together a fairly good collection of the most common AM hardware. So I have sheet metal screws, I've got Tinnerman nuts, I've got bolts, nuts, cotter pins, all that stuff. I've got a good supply of it, as well as um, Adele clamps and all that kind of thing. And that, that's what I want to use on the, on the aircraft. Uh, so uh, go through me and go through the ship managers uh, to get anything repaired. Uh, for you ship managers, uh, please use the right parts. <laughs> Uh, the uh, the diapers and cowboy boots. That's about all I. Yeah, that's, that's as fancy as I. Uh, so the use the right parts. Use uh, uh, proper AN hardware. That's really an important item. And the uh, uh, there's a difference between an AN hardware and McGuckin's hardware store. Uh, nuts and bolts and screws and all those kinds of things. Uh, the AN hardware is properly coated with cadmium to prevent corrosion. Cadmium also acts as a lubricant. So when you, you, you set the torque, uh, the torque that's uh, specified on aircraft is specific to AN hardware. So uh, make sure you use it. And uh, it also, it's a lot stronger. And the alloys are designed so that they'll, they'll, fl they'll bend before they break. They, they're, uh, uh, they have a much higher strength and uh, that's really the only thing to use. And, you know, I'm addressing primarily club ships, but the same goes for privately, uh, privately owned aircraft for you guys that own your own gliders. Uh, you should really be using the proper A and hardware. And if you need something and you don't have it, let me know, because I, I probably have it. And if not, I have two different friends on the airport. One of them salvages, uh, uh, buys, old FBOs and he has crates and crates of AM hardware. And anytime I can call him, I can go over to his hangar and pull a piece and then replace it. You know, I mean, he has tons of the stuff so uh, I can always get the right hardware. So let me know, even for your privately owned aircraft, uh, if you need something, uh, I'm, I'll be glad to help you source that and get it for you uh, and probably right away. Uh, so, also use good quality tires, tubes, and brakes. 
these gliders in particular, you know, I take care of the tow planes and they're pretty straightforward because everything's out in the open, you can see it. But these gliders are, uh, it's all closed up. It's really hard to see. It's one of the reasons that we've had trouble with people checking the, the uh, tire pressures is because it's so difficult to do. You have to roll the thing and uh, get it all aligned and they're all covered and they have fairings over them and everything. Uh, and I just finished doing uh, One Echo Fox, the uh, ASK 21. I just serviced that flat tire. The tire was no good. It was just worn out. But when I took off the wheel fairing, it was completely packed with mud, including in the brakes. And you couldn't see it. You wouldn't have known until you had to service it. So they really take a beating and, you, and they rarely get inspected until something breaks. So uh, that really take care of those and uh, you know we need the tires on the aircraft it's it's a, sa a safety problem they get used hard these club aircraft get used hard uh, when they cut when you do service it uh, and I'm glad to help with that as well I've now done all the aircraft the, the both discus I've done like one echo fox two or three times and I've done Papa Bravo and I'm glad to help help with any of them uh, and it's the sequence of events is really important when doing the, that work, uh, how things are removed and remembering how they go back together. So it's, it's, everything is really tight once you pull those off and, and it takes a while to understand how it goes back together. Uh, consequently, when I'm servicing one of those glider aircraft, if I'm doing a main wheel or something, if I have to change a tire, if I'm gonna go through the work of taking it apart, I'm gonna do everything that I can do in there while, while I've got it apart. Uh, so even if the brakes, if, you know, so I'll do uh, change the wheel, I change the tube every time I change the tire. Uh, I have reused tubes before. If, if we don't have one and, you know, I have to order it or something, sometimes I'll put, it, if the tube looks good, I'll put it in, but I'd rather not. If, I, if it's in stock, I always put in a new tube and uh, always uh, I change out the brake linings and I've got uh, the brake linings on the gliders. I, th I think I'm correct here. I think all four of the club ships and probably a good number of private ships uh, have the same brake linings as the Super Cub and the Pawnee. And I've got boxes of them. I have probably 30 sets in inventory, brand new sets over in the hangar. And so if uh, I change them, I change those linings, it costs about $20 to change the linings on the brakes on a glider. So it's just not a big deal. I just change them out. Even if they're halfway there, uh, they, they take really tough use. So I go ahead and change them out and repack the bearings if applicable. One Echo Fox has uh, needle bearings that need to be packed. Uh, I think all three other club ships have uh, sealed bearings, but do everything and then clean it up and put it back together. Uh, we probably lost three or four pounds of mud in one Echo Fox uh, when I did the, the wheels recently. Uh, another thing, uh, let's see. Oh, this is just kind of an add on. You know how it's pretty difficult to reach the Schrader valves on these tires and tubes. Uh, sometimes it takes a special tool or some, you know, an extension or something like that on the, on the Schrader valve. One thing that I've found that will really help uh, is to use a blow gun. Uh, I just fixed the, the compressor that's in the parachute shack and I'm going to buy a new hose. I want to get a straight hose instead of that coiled one because it's easier to manage. And I'll get a blow gun and I'll try to find an even better one. But uh, that's what this is. You know, it's used for blowing off, blowing dust off of things. If you've done fiberglass work, you'd probably use that to blow the dust off. But that little tip, or right there, that black thing, you can just poke that into the Schrader valve and fill it and it'll work and then check it with the gauge. I do that on my plane on my tail wheel because I can't get to the Schrader valve any other way. So that's just a little tip. Uh, next item, uh, and you know, another one of the reasons that uh, I insist on the tow planes on using A and hardware is what if somebody saw the work and I, I used hardware store bolts, even cotter pins. I won't use uh, zinc coated cotter pins. I only use cadmium ones because those are the aircraft grade cotter pins. And 
the, if somebody else works on anything, I'd be embarrassed if, if they saw, you know, hardware store stuff, because let's see if I can, uh, let's see. I've lost control of my, Hello, I can't change my uh, screen here. You may have to unshare and share again. Okay. There, can you see that? Now we just see you at the moment. You can't, you can't, can you see this, the uh, screen share? No. Negative. Oh. Okay, let's see here. Sorry about that. Let's try again. Yeah. Now we okay. got screen share. Rather than uh, going full screen, I think I'll just use it like this. I apologize for showing these menus, but this seems to work, so I'm going to stick with it. There, can you see that? Yes. Okay. That's what using hardware store hardware looks like to me. When I look into an airplane and I see uh, <laughs> Harbor Freight stuff in there, it's the equivalent of using a trash bag to cover a broken window in a car. It takes the water out, it works for a while. Uh, tow pilots. So now we'll go on to uh, talking about towing uh, and uh, ground operations during, during uh, launches. Uh, so I'll go through sections. Uh, first, we'll talk about tow pilots and wing runners and then uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, glider pilots. So for tow pilots, for you guys, uh, it's very important to do a thorough pre-flight. So go through the thing and uh, as John Stewart always says, the most important thing to check is the tail wheel. Make sure you give that a really good look. Uh, exercise the rope release. Look for broken bolts, for missing bolts. I've seen that. I've seen broken, uh, broken bolts. I've seen missing bolts on the tail springs. Uh, I've seen broken chains. And I've also seen where the chain attaches to the tow wheel. It'll be worn almost all the way through so that uh, as much as three quarters of the metal is gone from that little uh, uh, U-shaped fastener. So really take a look at that because uh, that's a serious safety issue if we lose control of the tail wheel. Uh, so go through the whole aircraft and, and with special emphasis on that and as well as the oil and you'll, uh, the oil and the fuel uh, and, and look at inside the uh, uh, under, under the hood of the aircraft. Uh, also, tow pilots, there's now a, a clipboard attached to the, the uh, bench on the right side of the bench, just under that vise. You can find a clipboard that I put together. It's an Excel spreadsheet and it shows all the upcoming inspections. And uh, uh, make sure that I'm on top of it. I will print it out about once a month and it shows when the annuals do when recurring ADs are due, like the muffler on the Super Cub and so on. So we don't want to get behind on that. It shows when the next oil change is due. Uh, you're welcome to look at it. I'm looking at it too, so I hope to stay on top of that. And, uh, that's something that I'd like to also see for the gliders. I'm not in charge of that. That's, you know, I don't want to step on the toes of the ship managers, but uh, we've talked several times about putting together a database. And the system I use is about as simple as you can get, but I, I, it works and it's, it's uh, straightforward and easy to keep up on. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna offer that to the, the ship managers if they'd like to uh, use something similar to that. Uh, and uh, as you do a pre-flight, as I said before, report squawks to GDS, RIB, uh, that's me of course. And uh, uh, you can write them right on that clipboard if you'd like. Uh, if it's serious enough to, air, to make the aircraft airworthy, then note it as such. There's red notes on the workbench, fill it out, 
put it on the seat of the airplane and send out an email to the tow pilot saying that it's grounded and, and why. Uh, so once you start your tow or once you get ready to go fly, I highly recommend that uh, the first thing you do is fly once around the pattern before the first tow. Uh, I didn't used to do this and Mark Terry got me started doing that. He said, air taxi over there. And because then that first flight, that first full application of power uh, is without a tow, without a tow. So you don't have a glider uh, behind you, depending on you to give them a tow. So you can check it all out, check the aircraft, check yourself. Uh, I often exercise, you know, do a Dutch roll over the runway, which is not a roll. That's a back and forth. That's a one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Check, check and, you know, make sure everything feels right. That's that first flight. I'm really careful about looking at the RPM, making sure I got with this new propeller, you'll get about 2,300, maybe a little more RPM, 2,300. Make sure that, uh, you know, you're getting proper oil pressure, oil temps, everything looks good and then go land. I just do the normal pattern. You can do the tow plane pattern if you'd like, but I just do the rectangular pattern around and then land on the glider runway. And then I'm, I'm ready to go. The thing's warmed up. I've checked it out. Uh, next thing I do, I get on the ground, uh, check the tow rope. Uh, I like to check the whole thing. You check the knots, of course, and uh, I run the whole thing and I uh, put it in my hand on one end I'll attach it to the tow plane and then run my hand and then run it all the way over to the other end. Just looking for a core shot or any of loose threads coming out or anything like that. Make sure there's nothing wrong with it. I've never found anything, but I, I feel better having checked it. Uh, then you'll be ready to tow. Uh, and so you go out, and of course, pull out in front of the, the glider. Uh, one of the things I like to do is uh, give it some gas when you're when you're gu getting up over the hump. They'll be lined up. The glider will be lined up on the chip seal. Uh, give it a little power to get over the hump. You get up on the chip seal before you make the turn, and then come back on the power before you uh, turn and point down the runway, so that you're not blasting the glider. The glider usually has their cock their uh, canopy up, and there's guys hanging around out there, and you don't want to blast them with a bunch of power. So hit it with the power, and then you know, hit that left brake a little bit once you get up on the chip seal and bring the tail around and then go real easy on the power as you're pulling forward so you don't blast everybody out and blow their hats off or, or importantly, blow the canopy down and, uh, and damage it. Uh, once you're hooked up, and we'll go through wing runner stuff here shortly, as I said, once you're hooked up, uh, you wanna communicate with the glider pilot and uh, also, you know, check the wind. Everybody's lined up on eight. You know, a lot of times operations at airports at all levels are follow the leader. Everybody's taking off on eight. Uh, check the wind. Make sure that you don't have a cross section, you're not, a cross wind that you're not anticipating or a slight tailwind or something like that. Something that you want to be ready for whatever the conditions are. So check the wind uh, and then communicate with the glider pilot. You know, once they're set, once you see them, they're in the glider and they're all checked out. Uh, expect them, they sh it's on them, they should contact you shortly uh, with their initials and a tow request. So it'll be uh, tow plane out of three Aggie, it's one e Echo Fox, initials Golf, Delta Sierra, request pattern tows. And then Roger, you give it back to him, you know, Roger that. Uh, and then you'll be watching in the mirror and uh, you can see when they lower the canopies and usually uh, uh, the uh, wing runner then will be talking to the pilot and show on the rope and then hook up the glider. And then he will uh, give you the, the signal to take up slack. Uh, I, I don't like to pull the glider because usually the signal guy is standing in front of it, waving his hat or something like that. So I usually pull up and uh, for you non-tow pilots, you can kind of see what's going on back there, but not very well. Uh, but I pull up and I leave a little bit of slack and I wait until the guy's out of the way before I take up the rest of the slack. Uh, and then when they're ready to go, uh, then the glider guys are doing their things, checking everything. 
and uh, you should be ready to go uh, after you get the uh, take up slack. And they'll give you the rudder wag. And if you can see it, I like to return the rudder wag and you give them a nice slow one, one, two, one, two, because then they can see it and they know you're doing it. And then you announce and you, you know, the usual, uh, you know, 93 Yankee, departing glider eight, glider in tow. Uh, if something comes up, which happens if there's you know, a dog on the runway or uh, you didn't see somebody, the, a power plane has taken off uh, and you don't want to launch yet, go ahead and report it to the glider. So you say glider one Echo Fox is tow plane 903 Yankee, stand by for departing traffic on runway A. Otherwise the glider may be thinking that something's wrong or you know, you, they don't know what's going on. So say, you know, let them know, stand by for departing traffic on runway eight. And when that guy's up and in a safe position, then you say, okay, now you're ready. Then it's, then you're ready to launch. And you say, I'm, you know, okay, now you're three Yankee departing glider eight, glider in tow. Uh, tow pilots, this is important. Follow noise abatement and safety procedures. Over the years, John Stewart has put together quite a complex system of departures and altitudes to fly when towing, uh, whether you're in the pattern, whether you're doing a south tow, whether you're doing a north tow. And uh, these procedures are much more important than finding lift in a hurry, despite what the guy behind you may say or, or think. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's, uh, it, these are club rules. These are not FARs. We can depart legally anytime we want. We can depart and fly right over the city of Boulder and go due west uh, because we're in a departure. It's legal to fly, but it's really bad news. And the reason is uh, it makes, it, it's, uh, it's really not the mark of a good neighbor. There's a lot of very noise sensitive people around Boulder in Boulder and around Boulder, and they don't want to hear it. And I don't blame them, especially when we're under tow, under full power. Uh, you know, I don't want people flying over my house either. But uh, but it is illegal to do. And uh, so don't, but don't be a rogue, rogue pilot and do it. Follow the procedures that you were trained to do originally. Uh, and don't take any shortcuts. What happens when we go outside of those is there's quite a group of people and they, they are northwest and south of us and all these aircraft have adsb the power aircraft all have adsb and these people are watching they all have these little gizmos on their computers and looking on flight aware they get the tail number and they either make a noise complaint to the airport which is really not too big, big of a deal because the airport manager he gets enough of them and he fields those calls frequently, but when he gets a spike, he'll call us and discuss it and see if, you know, make sure that we're emphasizing to our members, our tow pilots to, to follow our procedures. Uh, but what they've been doing most recently is complaining to the FAA. There's a complaint line and they, they don't make, well, they make a noise complaint, but they also make a claim, complaint that because the ADSB provides altitude information and they know that the FAR state that you're supposed to uh, maintain 1000 feet or greater above a populated area. So if you are at uh, say, you know, 6,000 feet uh, and you go to the north of J road, you're below a thousand feet. And so they'll make a complaint to the FAA and the FAA is required by their regulations to investigate every one of those complaints. And they know that, so that happens. We just had one last week and it wasn't Jay Road, it was something else. Somebody, uh, one of the tow planes was returning from a, tow, from a mountain tow, came through Boulder Canyon and got kind of low over Boulder. <laughs> of course, it is legal to fly below a thousand feet uh, when approach when you're doing an approach to landing or doing a takeoff, otherwise you you know you'd never be able to fly. So that's the explanation, and the FAA is 
receptive to that and they're just doing their job. They're and the one we took last, the, the complaint we took last week was a just kind of a routine call. And he said, I, you know, I, I know you guys were returning to landing, but uh, this is a, uh, you know, I have to take, I have to investigate this. I can't close the book till I talk to you guys. So, uh, you know, Clemens is the president. He gets the call. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He, he calls me, have you had one of these before? Yes, and then we talk to John Stewart and it's multiple emails and then he calls the FAA, Clemens talked to the FAA. It's all taken care of, but by flying a little bit low, instead of flying high and, and uh, doing a descent inside the, the glider box, uh, we go through all this hassle. So, you know, it's, it's easy to have a don't tread on me attitude when, uh, when you don't have to deal with the consequences. So please follow the procedures and uh, we'll be better neighbors and uh, avoid all the housing and take a significant amount of uh, very annoying work off of the shoulders of the president who already does plenty of work by, uh, for the club. Uh, so don't take shortcuts. Uh, at the end of the day, after doing all the toes, uh, make sure you fill the Pawnee up to the top. That thing, it takes a long time to get the last five gallons in. Uh, if you can, go ahead and take that time and fill it because it's a wide, flat tank. You fill it and it settles and then you put some more in. Uh, the Super Cub, I usually, uh, I'll fill it if the weather is cold and so on, but uh, if it's down to three quarters, five eighths of a tank, something like that, I'll just leave it. And <clears throat> the reason is that it's frequently called upon to do training. And there's a lot of times there's two pilots in it. When there's two pilots, you know, when, when it's a check flight, when it's a spring check, there'll be two guys in the super cub and they're usually doing a pattern tow with two guys in a, in a dual ship. So it's a quite a load. So it's nice to have a, a reduced fuel load. And they're not, the Super Cub does fewer mountain toes than the Pawnee. So the, the uh, amount of endurance required, fuel endurance is less. So I just leave that about, you know, if it's half full, I'll leave it at half full. Uh, and then very important too is at the end of the day, complete the logbook. There's a paper logbook in the aircraft for you tow pilot or glider pilots, you may, may not know this, but everything's recorded hours and altitudes in a logbook in the tow plane, and then also cadet log entries. Uh, it saves a lot of time. If, if those are incomplete, there's all kinds of headaches that have to be, you know, it has to be followed up later in order to complete the billing for the month. Uh, and then report squawks. Uh, I've said that a few times. Uh, next, we'll talk about the wing runner responsibilities. Uh, first, uh, for you folks that are new to the new to the club, uh, to be a wing runner, there's an online course, and you can get a certificate for it. It's uh, listed here. These uh, uh, this packet will go out, uh, be published. I, I believe we we put it on uh, uh, the SSB website. So you can find this there or your instructor can find it, take the course, find out what the hand signals are and all that kind of thing. Uh, wing runners, uh, please use the sterile, con sterile cockpit concept. <clears throat> Airline pilots have sterile cockpits, I think below 10,000 feet, uh, which means all they talk about is flight things, you know, get out the, the takeoff checklist, get out the checklist, uh, you know, put down flaps, put up flaps, whatever the case may be, but they can't talk about anything. They can't have any conversation. That's called having a sterile cockpit. And uh, it's a good idea to do that as a wing runner as well. So no conversations unless it's part of the launch. Uh, also no distractions. Don't be talking on your cell phone, looking at a text or have helpers that are, uh, you know, girlfriends, grandkids or, or whatever, you know, have them stand clear. It's, it's serious business when we're launching an aircraft and we don't want to, to cause a problem with the launch or have a, a helper 
you know, somebody who's not experienced with being on the runway uh, be hurt. Uh, wing runners, be visible behind the tow plane. Uh, when you're saying, you know, when you give the signal to take up slack and you give them the, the wave, uh, put your hat in your hand or use the rope hook. You know, don't hit the glider with it, but uh, swing it. It makes it more visible. When you get to the end of the rope and there's a little bit of slack, uh, if the look at the wiffle ball, if it's out there, if, if it's in the middle of the slack, it's a lot easier for the uh, tow pilot to see it. So he can then pull up the slack. Once you go out to the wingtip, he can pull up slack and he'll see it. He'll be able to see the wiffle ball, make it a lot easier. Uh, for the wing runners, the north wing should be up. When you're facing down, looking down runway eight, that's the left wing. So the north wing will be up. It provides more clearance for landing aircraft. Uh, do a 360 look for traffic. Uh, one of the most important jobs a wing runner does is to look for traffic, look for landing traffic, look for traffic that's about to take off and keep, you know, don't give the thumbs up if there's anybody uh, landing or taking off. Uh, some, some clubs have a procedure of pointing a finger in the sky. So the wing runner will give the look and, uh, and point his finger up in the sky, look down the runway and then go 360 all the way around, looking at downwind, looking at base, looking at uh, final for, for traffic. Uh, that's, that's not a club rule, but it's, it's a good idea. Uh, one runway at Boulder. Uh, this has been covered many times, but I don't think it can be covered enough because it, it's really important to, uh, for safety ops as well as keeping us out of trouble with the FAA because the FAA, you never know when the FAA is on the field and watching what we're doing. Um, they promised us that they would be watching our operations. Uh, when we started the parachute ops uh, or when, when, when uh, the, the parachutists started uh, doing their jumps last year, uh, there were some safety concerns and they promised us that they would be doing uh, blind audits of the operations. In other words, coming out and watching and seeing what's going on. Uh, so we don't wanna be launching a glider at the same time a power plane is taken off. There's only one runway at Boulder and it goes from the chip seal to the other side of the power runway and only one guy can land and take off at a time. So if there's a power plane taken off, we don't take off. If we're taken off, they, they should hold. Uh, so look for power and glider traffic landing. It takes good judgment really to judge the landing traffic. You know, we have a lot of uh, student pilots flying power planes at Boulder and they fly a downwind that I don't know where they go, but it's, I think it's all the way to the foothills sometimes. They're way out there. And when you see a, a 172 doing uh, uh, pattern work, and it's obviously a student, you can hear them on the radio and everything. And when they turn base, you got plenty of time to launch. Those guys, you know, they're, they're still two minutes away from landing. But if you see a tow plane coming overhead, he's about to land, he's seconds from landing when he's on crosswind. So that's, that's a factor, you know, so you have to use judgment. And so you just have to develop by, by being out there a lot, but uh, uh, please consider that and, uh, uh, do not level the wings. Don't pull that north wing down until the conflicting traffic is clear and the glider's ready. You'll get the thumbs up. You know, you'll be standing, the wing runner will be standing there with a thumb, thumb up and the glider pilot then gives him the thumbs up. Then you pull the wing down, level the wings. Uh, if something changes, something surprises you, you see something you didn't see at first, uh, put the wing back up and put your thumb down. So you can cancel the launch if, if there's a, a good reason to do so. Uh, next, we'll talk about the glider pilots. Uh, to start with, when you're pushing out onto the runway, you know, that's an active runway. Uh, so don't rush because, you know, you need time to do everything safely, go through the checklist and everything, but be ready. So don't rush, but be ready. Uh, after you push, you're blocking an active runway. The avionics should be set, oxygen should be on, 
parachutes should be on. Uh, all that should be done before you push. You don't want to go out there and be figuring things out. It should be already figured out. You know, the vario should be on, uh, tuned to the right frequency on the radio. Uh, everything should be ready to go. All you got to do is jump in, put your uh, safety restraints on, uh, uh, go through your checklists, and get hooked up and go. And uh, it's particularly important on the weekends. When everything gets busy, there's a lot of power traffic. When uh, mile high gliding is in full swing and we've got a lot of guys and we've got a lot of, you know, we've got in the morning, we'll have uh, guys in training. And then in the afternoon, we guys got that are hot to trot to go up and go soaring. Uh, it gets real busy. So don't push until you're ready. If you're, uh, if you're on the list and you're anxious, but you're really not ready, uh, do the right thing and let the next guy go and you can go net. trade places with him and let him go because you don't want to hold up the whole, sh whole show. Uh, if you start to push and a glider or tow plane show up on base, push back, get out of his way. You see mile high do that for us and we should do that for them as well. If somebody's coming in for a landing, you know, we push and we didn't see the guy coming in. I go ahead and push it right back in. If you're out there sitting in the glider, it's impractical to do that. And they'll just have to go to the side, go in the dirt. But uh, if you can push back. Uh, when, once you jump in, check your controls before you hook, hook up. <coughs> you don't want to give an accidental launch signal. Uh, one thing of note that a lot of your glider pilots may not know, you know, we have a rear view mirror in the tow planes. They're not very good. They're very small it vibrates like crazy and it looks through the, the plexiglass. It doesn't look straight out like we do when we look out the window, it looks through diagonally. So you're looking through a long length of scratchy old plexiglass. It's really hard to see anything. I can see when the cockpit closes or when the canopy closes and I can see the slack on the rope, but like, uh, you know, if you uh, stick your hand out the vent and give me the bird, I can't see that. So uh, everything has to be, if you give a signal, it needs to be exaggerated and obvious. And that goes for the wing runners as well. So uh, when you give a, a rudder wag, uh, I would say when you do a rudder wag, when gliders do rudder wags to, to signal that they're ready to launch, uh, you know, I see probably uh, 30% of them. The rest of them, I never see it. I can't see anything. And maybe it's because I'm an old coot, my eyes aren't as good. But if you do this, I'll never see it. It has to be one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, like that. Go to the stops, go slow, don't abuse the glider, but go to the stop, to the stop, to the stop, to the stop. And uh, I I know I don't think all tow ballots do, but I respond with a rudder wag. I do the same thing, but I go one, two, one, two, I'm ready to go. And then I announce, and I was, you know, nine three Yankee departing glider eight, glider in tow. So make all the signals obvious. But that's one of the reasons I'd, I like for the wing runner to put the wing back up if something's canceled. You know, if, if the glider pilot signals to the wing runner, you know, no, we can't go. I found a problem of some kind. There's a bee in the cockpit, whatever. Put the wing up. I can see that. So uh, that's a good signal to the tow pilot that something's wrong. Uh, another reason to make it obvious is, or exaggerated and longer than you think it should be is the tow pilot, he may be busy writing in his logbook, writing down the altitude from the last release checking the fuel reserve, looking in his notes or, or something else, you never know. Maybe looking at the wind, he may be watching down range, seeing if mile high gliding tow plane is gonna cross the runway. So uh, uh, make it obvious. When in doubt, give him a call. Hear, hear it all the time and that's good. I'm glad to hear it. You know, one echo, you know, nine three Yankee, one echo Fox, we're ready to launch, roger that. And then, then we go. Uh, yep, covered that. Uh, oh, when I already said this, and this has been drilled in many times to everybody, but make sure you tell on your first tow, 
at a minimum on your first toe, tell the toe plane who you are and what you want. Nine three Yankee, glider one echo fox, billing initials GDS pattern toe. You know, give them the usual. Uh, glider pilots use standard radio calls in the pattern. Generally, you know, if it's not busy, uh, you know, when I'm flying a glider, I usually call crosswind and that's about it. But Saturdays, a lot of times that's not enough because you have gliders, you know, other gliders in the glider pattern and a lot of power traffic and tow planes and all that kind of thing. There's just a lot of traffic. So uh, call out your base turn, call out on final. If there's, if there's any question, use the radio. I find that glider pilots use the radio much less than power pilots. And uh, when it's a busy weekend, there's no reason for that. You should uh, announce everything uh, so everybody knows what's going on. Uh, once you're up in the air and you're like you're out in the mountains and you're hunting around for lift, use the radio to direct the tow pilot during the tow. Uh, I know we all learned in, in our uh, school that you can, you know, go out to the, you know, swing out to the right and to point the nose, you know, to make him turn left and those kind of things. But uh, I'm going to show you a video here in a minute of why that is for, for soar, soaring in Boulder. It's, it's not really very practical uh, because we do a lot of training. So, uh, and there's a lot of turbulence up in the mountains. So it, it's not very effective way of communicating. It's better to just talk to the guy and say, uh, you know, plus five knots, please. And if possible, he'll do it. Or plus, uh, you know, turn left at 20 degrees, go, let's go toward the bottom where that gray cloud is gray on the bottom, you know, that kind of thing. Just tell them on the radio. Uh, if you need to have a conversation, tell them to switch to 123.3. Tell the tow plane, can you switch to 123.3? Then get him on 233 and say, hey, I'm, we're not finding anything. I'm not happy. Can you take me, you know, let's go deeper. You can have a little more in-depth conversation about uh, soaring on 123.3. Uh, glider pilots, don't ask for a shortcut. You're not going to get it. And if you do, it's, it's not right because you'll be flying over houses and we already went through that. And we don't want to have to deal with these FAA calls or all the nuts who are you know, don't like airplanes and dealing with all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's, you know, the, uh, we go out of our way to go uh, to, to avoid houses. And I, it probably costs uh, per tow, it probably costs about a minute extra when you go up in the mountains, you know, it's really insignificant. So uh, just let's just follow those procedures. Uh, this one, uh, one of the guys, I, I asked for suggestions from uh, tow pilots and this was one that uh, was brought up to me. Uh, avoid boxing the wake and doing slack lines when you're solo, unless you've already briefed the tow pilot. The tow pilot's not expecting it. And the guy that submitted this was uh, towing a guy in a single and the, uh, he made the 270 and he crossed over the 26 and the guy started boxing the wake while southbound. And, you know, for, as I said, we have uh, limited visibility with the mirror and boxing the wake. I mean, when you tow a lot, you know, it's one Echo Fox, it's Bob Ferris and a student. And you go out, you do your turn and you go head west on the Belmont leg and the glider box, he's going to box away. He does it every time. Then you make the turn, left turn and go down, do the Arapaho leg. Oh, now he's going to do a slack. You know, I mean, that's what you're expecting it, but you're not expecting it when you're southbound and you just cross two six. You think something's wrong with the glider and you're watching and you're wondering if you need to release him because you're, you know, the glider, you, you know, one of the ways uh, tow pilots stay alive is to have the attitude that there's a guy back there that's trying to kill me and it's my job to not let him. So when he starts something like that, that's unpredicted, that it's unexpected, I should say, uh, you reach up and you got your hand on the knob and you're going, what's going on back there? So if you, if you want to do box the wake and slack lines and stuff solo, no big deal, just brief the tow pilot. 
whether, you know, before the flight or on the radio. Uh, don't ask for shortcuts, I already said that. Uh, one more th last thing is uh, announce your release in turbulent conditions. Uh, I've been on toes, especially on a, a wavy day when you're flying through rotors and you know your legs are turning blue from your how tight your seat belt is. Uh, you're bouncing around. You don't know when the guy releases. So time difference. Uh, go ahead and announce your release. Say I'm. You know. Uh, uh, you know, whiskey Alpha Yankee is is off tow. You know, and then tow pilot will frequently say, "Okay, nine hundred thousand five hundred, I'm off." Bye. Uh, so that is almost the conclusion. Let's see. Yes, please take our safety procedures seriously, and uh, I want to thank everybody in the club who. Uh, keeps our aircraft worthy, who flies the tow planes and the wing walkers, all you guys that do all that groundwork, thanks very much for, uh, for supporting this fantastic sport. We have a lot of fun out there. And uh, it's, I, I, one of the things I really love about being in this club is the work that the, uh, uh, everybody does. Everybody just jumps in and does things. Sometimes we'll, you know, like, We've had a couple of recent rants on the emails and uh, it stimulates the proper activity. It's, you know, I'd rather not have that, but as soon as something happened, people jump right in. So thanks to everybody who does that. It makes it more fun and it's a lot better than arguing about it. I mean, we, we get things done and I'm, I'm really proud of that. I, I, it, it's a fantastic club and I, I don't know any other club in the country, but I, I still tell people that, that this is the best club in the country. Uh, let me, before I close, let me see here. Oh, here we go. I'm going to play this video. I hope this all works for you. There we go. And Steve Kapner, I know you're on. You've seen this before. You, that's you wing walking. You used to be in the video in the beginning, but I shortened it to, to uh, so people, so it'd be a little quicker. How was it up there, Rob? How'd it smooth. go? Smooth. Smooth? Yeah. Not too bad. Did uh, the uh, guy try to break the tail off or anything? The uh, box in the wake was a little rough at first, but it got better. Was it? I, I see you threw up in the cockpit. Any other problem? <laughs> well, I kind of wet myself too. Okay. <laughs> That's my presentation. Well, Gary, thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> and I'd also like to say that there's uh, 10 extra credit points if anybody can identify that music and what movie it was in. <laughs> I want to be the bird. <laughs> Not that old. Nobody? Oh, yeah, you got to be my age. That's, that was from uh, Easy Rider.
I just watched that movie. It doesn't age very well. It, you know, it used to be edgy, but now it's just no, kind no, it's terrible. Of amazing, kind of amusingly weird. But anyway, you have to be 21, 40 years ago. That's it. Yeah. Um, okay. Questions, comments, or observations? Hey, Gary, one thing, uh, when I was with Chris Lang down there with my glider, he used nitrogen in his tires and I started using his nitrogen in my tires too. And tire inflation seems to be a challenge for the club over all the years I've been in it. Um, any chance, what it does is it also reduces the need for keeping putting air in and air in and air in. Yep. I'm wondering whether or not uh, it might be interesting to entertain uh, getting a small bottle of nitrogen and uh, using that so that, uh, you know, we're not constantly uh, low on, especially glider tires, because that seems to be the challenge for us. They're low and then they go flat. Yeah, and it reduces the life and makes it less safe. Yeah. Uh, it's a thought. It's a thought. And it would not be expensive to do. We just we have to buy a regulator and order a tank. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I used to borrow his, and you, you got a hell of a lot of nitrogen in there, and you don't have to put it in very often, so it probably be cheap. But uh, yeah, it doesn't leak out of the tubes as as quickly. Yeah, but anyway, that's just an idea. Yep. Good hey, idea. Gary. Gary. Steve. Steve Camp asked if you would comment anything on on kiting. Okay. Uh, fortunately, I've never had the experience. Uh, it is, uh, well, I've come close, but I, uh, kiting is when uh, your undertow and the glider uh, goes out of sight above, goes, climb, goes in a steep climb and goes up. And what happens is because he's tied into the tow plane, uh, the tow plane doesn't have enough elevator authority to fight it. So his he pitches down. And if, if you're close to the ground, you know, it'll drive you right into the ground. So that's what, what kiting is. And uh, it's very dangerous. And that's what, uh, actually that would be a good bullet point in the presentation for tow pilots is always, uh, when I launch once, you know, the, the first two or three seconds until you've launched, until you're up, until you can make Elliot's field uh, in a glider, you know, until you're at the fence of the airport, that is an extremely tense time for a tow pilot. Uh, you're watching everything. You're trying to stay, stay on the runway and you keep glancing at the rear view mirror and you, you seeing if they're going to kite or seeing if their spoilers are going to pop open. And if so, that's, that's the time. That's when you're going to get killed. If a guy kites on takeoff, uh, that's when you, you got to pull the rope right now. You know, you, you can't waste any time. You got to, you got to release the glider because he'll lift the t if he does kite, he'll put you right into the ground, you know, and it's, it's doubtful that it's, you know, that that's a serious accident right there. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. And uh, yeah, it kills, it kills a few tow pilots every year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I have, I have one, one other suggestion uh, when you release, I think it's really important that you identify the tow pilot behind you that you're releasing from. And so what I've, what I've had happen to me was I was on a tow and another glider was being towed and the glider pilot said, thank you. And the tow pilot thought I had released and the tow pilot started to dive down, had, didn't look in the rear view mirror, hadn't checked that I had really released. So somebody else had released, announced over the radio that uh, they had released and my tow pilot thought I had released. And so I think it's it's really important if we, as, as glider pilots, if we say 9-3 Yankee, I'm off, uh, then it's clear to 9-3 Yankee that I'm off and not I'm off because if I'm off, uh, somebody else in a, on a different tow might interpret this as, as their glider is off. Does that That's make sense? Excellent point because, uh, you know, I know most of the guys I'm towing well, all of them really. I know who they are, and I know, kind of know their voice in the radio. So I, you know, I don't think I would do that. But a lot of the glider, glider, or the, a lot of the tow pilots, 
it's it's a white glider back there with some guy. Right. And we have, well, we have mile high is towing with two tow planes. We're towing yeah. with two tow planes. I mean, sometimes we've got four tow planes going up in the air at the same time. And so it's not easy for the, we don't want to have the tow pilot guessing as to who just released. Yeah. Good point. Anything else? Yeah. yeah. Bob, Bob's here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Armin. No, no, you go ahead. I. I just wanted to apologize and to admit to being time zone challenged. Um, Arizona is still on Mountain Standard Time, and you guys are on Mountain Daylight Time, so I missed the whole thing. But it was good to catch up anyway. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear that because you're now the uh, runway maintenance supervisor. I don't know if you, we, we elected you. Well, if I can borrow your backhoe, we're going to go move that uh, runway identifier sign for the thousand foot point. We're just going to move it. Well, a little bump is all it would take. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, I'll bring it over on Saturday. Good. Uh, I won't be there, so you'll be the guilty party. <laughs> all right. Well, a uh, couple things. Uh, Bob, it, there, there'll be a recording that'll be on the uh, YouTube website, so you'll be able to watch it. Um, I have a question if nobody else does. Okay. Um, propellers, uh, uh, specifically on 9-3 Yankee. Uh, uh, you know, 9-3 Yankee has not tugged like we'd all hoped it would. And uh, I know you put a new propeller on recently. Can you tell us a little bit about the new prop? And um, it definitely seems to be towing better, pulling better, but uh, it's, it's only been in fairly cold weather that I've been towed, but uh, it seems to be doing better. Can you speak to that at all? Yes, I can. During the annual, uh, one of the things we check is uh, the propeller. And, you know, it had that four blade composite propeller, the, the Hoffman, it's a German propeller, and it's four blades and short. And uh, it's a wood propeller that has, it's clad with a composite material and they're prone to cracking. So one of, and this, this hasn't been done in past annuals. This, this is one, another advantage of having John as our IA. He said, we gotta pull that propeller and look for cracks. We pulled the propeller and it's got a bunch of cracks in the back of it. We took pictures of it sent it to Germany and said, is this airworthy? Because there are some of the cracks, it's still airworthy, but they have to be a certain, you know, within certain limits. And they said, we can't tell unless you send it to us. And uh, the, uh, so we uh, did the safe thing and assumed it was not airworthy before, you know, if we're gonna send it or whatever we're gonna do with it. We had the propeller that came on the aircraft was a metal, a two blade metal prop. And it's been leaning in the hangar, on the hangar wall for ever since we bought the Pawnee. Uh, so I just put it on, bolted it on and uh, it's in good shape. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's an 84 inch propeller and I don't remember what the four blade is but it's much shorter than that. And uh, a, a longer props pull way harder than shorter props. The reason we use the four blade is that it's quieter. Uh, it's it's quieter, but it doesn't pull nearly as hard. And it's uh, we've been through a couple of them. They don't last very long. That that cracked propeller had sixteen hundred hours on it. Whereas the Super Cub, I think that propeller probably has fifteen thousand hours on it. I've never seen an entry for another one. It's a metal prop. You know, it lasts for a long, long time. And the metal, the metal prop was in good shape. We put it on, it's longer, it pulls a lot harder. Uh, it is louder. I've had uh, uh, one of my buddies on, in the, on the power side said, well, what'd you do to that Pawnee? I can hear it now. It sounds different than the other ones. It's a little bit louder. And I said, yeah, it's a little bit louder, but it's, it's not as loud as, you know, like a Cessna 185 or 206, one of those ones with that really annoying blatting sound when they take off. So this prop I think is good. And one of the reasons uh, it's, it's not super loud is it only turns at 2300 RPM. 
uh, that engine red lines at 2550. We could get a little more pull out of it if we had it repitched and, and could get it up to red line. But I, I think it pulls much harder and it's within what I considered an acceptable noise range that we're not gonna have a bunch of people squawking at us. And uh, I, you know, and I, you know, I, we're almost done so I can start this argument, but hopefully we won't go on too long. I, uh, you know, to address the idea that our tow planes don't pull hard enough, uh, I'm really of the opinion that our tow plane, like our 9-3 Yankee, that Pawnee does an average job. It's not a poor performer. I think it pulls like all the other Pawnees. I think that the one that Mile High has that we're comparing to is an exceptional one because their other Pawnee pulls just like ours. Uh, and, you know, as I'd, I'd rather have that powerful one from a uh, mile high and I've already told them we want to buy it, but uh, you know, they don't want to sell it of course, but uh, I told them we definitely don't, you know, you don't need to put it up for sale. If it goes up for sale, then uh, you know, I want to buy it. And uh, so, but I think that's exceptional and that's what we're comparing ourselves to. Uh, and, you know, when we think back to the, uh, 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 the previous pre presentations, Tom Zollner did the 14 or all the 14ers in Colorado from Boulder. Uh, what percentage of those were behind 9-3 Yankee? How many toes did he, of those did he get from 9-3 Yankee? Uh, I mean, same about his guess, Tom might have some idea, but if I took a wild guess, I would say probably three quarters of them, maybe 50%, I don't, I don't know. But that's what I would judge its performance on, not saving, you know, the difference between ours and the exceptional Pawnee that Mile High Gliding has is a couple minutes per tow to get you up in the mountains. It gets you up in the mountains every time and I'll take you as high as you wanna go. It's just, you know, when, when the temperature hits the right and when the clouds start to form, Every minute counts to a glider pilot's. Well, sorry, we're, you know, you're going to miss two minutes because we have an average tow plane instead of an exceptional one. So, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a nine three Yankee defender. <laughs> I think it's it works just like other Pawnees. Gary, if I can, if I could just say a little response to that. Yeah, probably two thirds of the flights that I've done have been behind the Pawnee. But what's most important especially in the vintage of airplane that I fly with water is to get it, uh, get, get my inertia going as quickly as possible. And, that, and that's the only difference that I see between Pawnees and between the Cub and the, Pawn, and the Pawnee. And uh, my older ship doesn't have good aileron control for the first uh, 50, 75 feet. And if, you know, I've been very lucky that I haven't had an issue because if I drop a wing, it's not coming back up and I have a CG hook. So that's why I'm really, you know, I always do the, the jackrabbit starts, hold the brakes on the, on the tow plane, run it all the way until I see air come to me and, and then, and then release. And that works pretty well. But the only difference is I just feel really safe behind the Pawnee, but the cub works fine too. I mean, it's, it's uh, you're splitting hairs here, but, Sometimes on different ships, it, it can make a difference. And I, you know, it's definitely not a two place either. So, but, you know, I think they both pull super well. And, you know, I, there isn't, there isn't one ship, one tow plane that I would, you know, uh, not take a tow from at this point. So, yeah. You know. And I, I've done that before, done the full run up and for launching you and, uh, but other tow pilots do it too, right? There's, you haven't had any resistance to that, have you? Uh, very little, very little. Yeah, because it, there's nothing. It's just, it's fine. I don't. I'll do it every time. Doesn't you know? Doesn't cost extra. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, I apologize if I'm speaking on something that's already been mentioned, but there was a towing accident today at the seniors. 
So speak up if I'm telling you a story you've already heard. But uh, apparently a pilot with a CG hook on a mini Nimbus uh, had a wing drop on takeoff and veered off. And somebody had left their pickup truck parked pretty close to the runway, it appeared. And this guy ran into the pickup truck. Uh, he apparently released, but ran into the pickup truck. And uh, he had severe injuries. He had uh, multiple broken legs, uh, open compound fractures, broken arms, badly injured, but got airlifted away and is apparently going to be okay. But this is another thing about CG hooks and uh, towing that you need to be very, uh, I think, aware of. And that is you want to get going as fast as possible to give the glider pilot rudder authority to be able to maintain straight alignment with the runway. And uh, there is some information on RAS about this. And uh, I got some pictures from Brenda Seaborn, but it was ugly. And apparently this guy left his pickup truck following, not following the runway, but way too close. And this guy veers, drops a wing, veers off and collides with the pickup truck ugly yeah so anyway this is serious business we're doing we do it for fun but it's serious things can happen yeah, yeah. gary a little history on the props uh two blade versus four uh, the short story is uh four blade is about a 15 percent power hit so we're we're flying at two 235 horsepower equivalent instead of a 265. And the main reason for the difference was the noise because we went through some real serious noise uh, issues years ago and everybody decided to take the power hit and the climb rate for, to minimize the noise impact. So we'll just have to see if that song plays itself again. Um, those four related props aren't cheap, but everybody ended up putting them on just to, to placate the uh, the uh, the drum beats of the uh, negative airport people. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, I don't really steel think prop was... should, everybody should be happy with a steel prop. You got fifteen percent back again. Yeah, and I don't think it's that loud. I mean, I've heard it. Well, you're old. <laughs> Deaf in one ear and can't hear out of the other. Yeah. yeah see. <laughs> hey, Gary. This is Jeff Clayton. Yes. Um, I know a while ago, I think probably back last year sometime, there was a discussion. Oh, actually, it was when uh, the tow plane had a high speed abort, and there was some discussion on yep. setting uh, standards or if it's possible. Was anything ever come of that? You know, like what direction the tow plane would go? And what uh, I have not heard any more. Right. And I, I have not heard any more on it. And I, uh, you know, one of our senior uh, CFIs should probably work on that and, and talk about it. In my own personal opinion, and I'm not a CFI, is it almost has to be done. It's a judgment issue, you know, because you don't, it depends on what's, what's downrange, where you're going to go. You know, so it's, I would say, a general rule is that the tow plane should go left and the glider should go right. But not if there's a pickup parked over there. Or a fence. Yeah, not if you're by mile high. If you're past mile high, you can turn left. But if you're at mile high, go straight. Yeah, the question's timely because I just got an email and uh, what Armand said is that um, it was going to be taken up at the next instructor's meeting and have some discussion based on the different feedback that was received on uh, the procedure. So. I think that I would say that there's going to be a definitive answer imminently. Yeah, I think it would be good to standardize it as much as possible the answer because the more, the, especially these routine, these routine things that we do, the more in these routine actions we know exactly what to do beforehand and not make a judgment call. That's that's usually the better recipe for, for avoiding 
uh, avoiding an accident, but it, it's, not, it's not always possible, obviously. The other factor I think you have to, and we don't do as many camps as we used to, um, is uh, depends on the airport you're at. You know, our procedure in Boulder may not be the procedure for Salida yeah. or Nephi or whatever. Um, and that gets you back to Gary, your judgment. But I think we've, we've got some pretty, what I do know from having three or four of them in 25 years is Topland gets the hell out of the way because if the glider's got any momentum at all, like Tom's carrying his water, they're going to overtake the tow plane in no time. So I would prefer the glider go straight and I get the hell out of the way instead of two of us trying to figure out which direction we may want to go. Joe, thanks for reminding me about the instructor meeting and, and we have not had one. So don't, don't feel like you, you've missed the invite. No, um, I got it today. You did? Yeah, I think I did. Who did, who did it come from? I don't know. God. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, did, it didn't. I didn't see me. him on the roster. He, he knew yeah. Jeff was going to ask the question so I could have a good answer. <laughs> anyway. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the prodding. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have an instructor meeting and take this up because we are about to get you know, once the snow melts, uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be pretty active, and we're going to be active with a lot of pilots who uh, who are not current. Uh, we're out of currency, so uh, we are going to have to huddle as 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 instructors and talk about how we're going to get everybody uh, current again, and and who's you know who's on deck here to do it. So uh, yeah, and and we would love to have you. Uh, at least for part of that meeting, uh, where we talk about tow plane and, and uh, aborted launches. So uh, that, that will happen. Um, I, I, on the question of safety, I have one other comment that came up in the presentation, and that is about uh, doing uh, boxing the wake or slack line uh, when solo. And I you know, I don't think that there's too many, uh, it's, it's very frequent that rated pilots practice to, uh, to slack line, uh, slack line and, uh, and, um, and boxing the wake. Uh, I think I've only done it once recently and that was because I'm an instructor and I got to instruct in it. So I figured, well, I better practice this rather than uh, demonstrate it poorly. So um, the club rule is, uh, student pilots are not to practice boxing the wake, slack line, or other emergency maneuvers like 200 foot, 300 foot releases, uh, that sort of thing, without an instructor. So um, students should not be practicing those maneuvers without an without an instructor on board. Um, so uh, hopefully we won't see any of that. And uh, if I do practice it. Uh, I will uh, uh, notify the the, the uh, tow pilot. But yeah, our tow pilots have been great. When when I'm with a student, you know, sometimes I've told them we're going to box awake, and they go, "Yeah, I figured you're going to do that." So uh, <laughs> it doesn't come as a big surprise uh, when it happens. Uh, so anyway, thanks to our tow pilots, uh, you, you all are doing just a wonderful job for us, and, and we really appreciate you coming out and towing when. Uh, when, when we have students and all that. Anything else? Anybody? All right. I want to comment just as an observation. If something needs to get done around the airport, fix it. The Echo Fox landed on the main runway. They drug it out through the mud. We got a nasty note from Tim saying, don't do it. But they left the goddamn divot there and I had to get the shovel and go out there and fill the hole. There's nothing, if, if we had to pull Echo Fox across because, well, one aircraft had to go around because of that, because they landed main runway, which is what they should have done. But if you make a, if something's screwed up, fix it, get the shovel and go out and fill the divot and then we don't piss Tim off or Tim has to be sensitive about that. But we can, 
we can do some of this airport maintenance that we might in, in, infringe on from time to time. I've gone out there and cut the bushes down from so we don't have to use a machete to go to the bathroom. Uh, you know, just take it upon yourselves to do it. I mean, it's, it's just not a big deal. But I think the first thing people have to be able to do is just see something that needs to get done. It's more than just brakes and tires on gliders. It's, it's everything that associates the facilities that we use and we need to keep in repair. So there's now, no I, I read Tim's, Tim's email on that. And he said, you know, clear the runway. So it said two things. One is only use that, go to the far end of the runway and cross for power planes. But he said, if a glider has to do it, clear the runway. Uh, so that's a bit confusing. Uh, you know, it's a long push back to that far end of the runway. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I don't know, hopefully that ground is gonna, gonna firm up here pretty soon. Yeah, it's, it was pretty nasty. I was really surprised. The feet footprints of dragging it through there was, you know, probably four or five inches deep. And, uh, but if it, you know, my idea is take Echo Fox off through, off that side soft slope and go out there and fill the divots uh, and pat them around. And, you know, after a snowstorm like that, you won't see them again. Yeah. But, but just don't leave them there, you know, and figure out somebody else is going to do it for the club or for the airport. I didn't know that happened. That's where all that mud came from, huh? Yep. Yeah. It was, the wheel well was packed. It was, it, yeah, it was, it was wait, wait, it was a big hole and about a four foot, you know, trench from the wheel being drugged through that mud. It, that soft shoulder is really soft. I was surprised. And uh, oh, fortunately, wow. I got to it with a shovel before it set up. And hopefully now it has set up and it's been flattened away. But, uh, but when things like that happen, let's just fix it. That's all I'm saying. Yep. Uh, on the, Speaking of the K21 and the and the and the skirt around the wheel, I mean, we had uh, Bob and I had talked about just leaving that skirt off the K21. I'm guessing Gary, when you fix the tire, you put the you put the fairing back on. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Now that the tire is is everything is functional, uh, maybe we can put it in a in a uh, in a cradle and pick it up and take that. Um, take that skirt off, that fairing off completely and leave it off. Um, that might be the right yeah. thing to do. Last, I've, when I've done work on that ship before, uh, the ship manager said he wanted it on, so I put it on. It's, yeah. you know, uh, I'm trying to leave a gate open. I, if, if I find a gate open, I leave it open. If I find it closed, I close it. Right. Um, at any rate, we'll, I'll bring that up with the ship manager and uh, we'll, we'll make a decision and uh, whether to leave that off. And probably would be better just to leave it off. It's because it makes it harder. It makes it really hard to fill the, uh, the, the, fill the tire on and on. Thanks, Gary. This is really well done. Thank you. I had fun. All right. Well, Gary, thanks so much. And uh, well, I guess we'll call it here. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining in. And uh, we hope to see everybody next week uh, for the Landout database. Have a good evening. See y'all.